Welcome to Camp Moana, a place apart. A place where one can leave the busy life behind to retreat to the woods, hills, rocks, and streams to commune with nature and the God who so graciously gave it to us. People started coming to this place apart long before it was Camp Moana, long before the Boy Scout camp which was here before it, long before the resort which was here before that. In the 1800s, Mansfield, Ohio was characteristic of the Industrial Revolution which transformed cities in the northern states. Steam engines and stove factories were built along with railroads which brought the carloads of coal and iron. Waste was dumped into the streams, smoke filled the air, a small town grew into a congested city. People who once took the country for granted now climbed into their horse-drawn carriages and fled to the countryside for relief, oftentimes directly from church, dressed in their Sunday finest. Picnic groves by streams and natural formations became popular. One such popular picnic grove was Fleming's Falls, located on Fleming Run, a tributary to the Black Fork River near Mansfield. Fleming's Falls derives its name from a 20-foot natural formation set in a steep sandstone gorge and from the family which owned the property from pioneer times until 1901. John Fleming built the first grist mill in Mifflin Township using the falls for power. His brother William operated another grist mill upstream along with a blacksmith shop. An early Richland County historian recounts how rough and steep the road was to Fleming's Falls, but how rich the reward was once the carriages arrived. It soon became a popular place for social gatherings. A stroll to the falls after a bucolic picnic by Fleming Run was the very definition of Richland County leisure in the 1800s. At the close of the century, industrialized cities all across the country addressed this need for rustic retreats by building city parks. Since transportation was by horse and buggy and no major rail line ran near Fleming's Falls, people found it easier to enjoy a day of leisure in these new urban parks. Shortly after Senator John Sherman gave land near his home in Mansfield for a park, Fleming's Falls fell into disuse. In 1898, a flood washed the grist mill away. Today, gudgeon holes above the falls, which anchored the foundation and mill wheel, are the only traces of John Fleming's grist mill. Throughout Camp Moana's history, legends have been told about the Fleming family. The most colorful one related how a tribe of native Delaware Indians resentful for the white man's intrusion and infringement, massacred the entire Fleming family. Later, after religious conversion, the remorseful Indians carved the faces of each family member above the falls as a tribute. The legend, which does have traces of the very real Copus massacre which took place in nearby Mifflin following the War of 1812, is neither accurate nor respectful of Native Americans. The Fleming family appears to have been ordinary farmers, millers, and smithies which owned the property into the 1900s. The faces above the falls? This early photo seems to show something very clear and interesting. Are they faces? Where did they come from? We don't know. For now, they remain the stuff of legends. At the turn of the century, the falls returned to their natural beauty, the grist mill having been washed away. The picnic grounds along Fleming Run lay fallow as the urban parks thrived. The leisure habits of Ohioans changed, however, with the advent of one new form of transportation, the interurban, large trolleys whose source of power was an overhead electric cable. They were called interurbans because they were designed to connect the major urban areas. Throughout the United States, many of these traction companies, as they were called, built amusement parks at the end of their lines as destinations for large numbers of their fare-paying passengers. Coney Island in New York 
is the best example of attraction park. The attraction companies also made advantage of existing attractions near the lines they built. In Ohio, many still remember Edgewater Park in Cleveland and Chippewa Park near Medina, which experienced growth spurts when the Cleveland Southwestern and Columbus Railway Company ran their tracks near them beginning in 1903. Fleming's Falls was one such attractive site, offering vacationers in North Central Ohio the opportunity to enjoy its natural beauty and charm. When the company announced its plans to extend its lines from Ashland to Mansfield, entrepreneurs built a 12-room hotel called the Fleming House. In 1908, the traction company built a station less than a mile from the already popular resort. Locals dubbed the trolley company the Green Line because of the color of its cars. The traction company's literature told prospective passengers that Fleming's Falls Resort is situated between Ashland and Mansfield on the southwestern line and is an ideal spot for Sunday school, church, and family picnics. The brochure stated that this resort possesses great natural beauty and has a dancing pavilion and many other attractions. The resort was designed to evoke an earlier and simpler time, including rustic bridges and log cabins, all long gone but known today because of the countless postcards mailed by visitors to Fleming's Falls during its heyday. The hotel featured an 85-foot porch with posts and railings of unhewn timber taken from the site. It shows the influence of several trends in American architecture and history, including the arts and crafts movement and the rustic architecture popular in the Adirondacks and other resorts and camps in the United States from the 1870s to the 1930s. Its character-defining features include its stone foundation, its unique massive shape reminiscent of early rural New England big house, back house, and barn combinations, its wood siding, the diamond pane wood windows, and the natural setting with which it blends, and its character defining feature, the rustic and rambling front porch. Although the interurban era is long gone, the hotel today looks much as it does in postcards mailed by visitors in the first decade of the 20th century. Throughout the years, various owners did what they could to attract visitors. Bridges were built to accommodate the newest form of transportation, the automobile. A log gatehouse was built at the entrance to the park. Footbridges were built to allow guests to hike the hills and visit the falls. A dance floor was built out from the steps leading up to the porch. On what is now Chapel Hill, a Ferris wheel and merry-go-round were installed. Sometimes there was special entertainment. During one Labor Day weekend, the Cleveland Southwestern Line scheduled trolleys hourly from Ashland to Mansfield for a huge weekend extravaganza featuring fireworks, dancing, a concert, and an exhibition drill by local World War I soldiers. The centerpiece of the weekend, however, was a water show starring the diving Diana and her six diving nymphs. The ad promised the prettiest girls and divers in the vaudeville profession swimming in a glass tank lighted by electricity. Admission was 10 cents. Soldiers were admitted free of charge. Guests would come to stay at the hotel for days at a time or to spend the afternoon strolling the grounds and picnicking by the water. They would always dress in their Sunday finest. One guest rode home on the back of her postcard, this is the era of big hats. The main attraction at Fleming's Falls Park though was always the natural beauty of the area. The trolley companies capitalized on this appeal and hyped Fleming's Falls with flowering language like this paragraph from the Southwestern brochure. Now comes the season when all attention is paid to nature, when the color of the forest calls and the breath of the wattle is in the air. Some place to roam where the extreme heat of the summer is tempered for us by the currents of cool air streaming down. 
where the hues of the sky under the influence of the saffron sunset or star-set moon beckon. There are many places reached by the southwestern lines where the scenery embraces every object which can charm the eye of a lover of sylvan subjects, for the atmosphere is surcharged with fragrance. Eventually, special events and flowery rhetoric would no longer bring large numbers of visitors to Fleming's Falls Park. As the automobile became more affordable to the average American and as roads became more passable, the trolley companies declined. As the years passed, Fleming's Falls Park became less and less profitable. Eventually, it was sold at sheriff's sale. It wasn't long, however, before others recognized the value of this natural resource. The grounds were purchased in 1925 by the Boy Scouts of America and named Camp Averhand for a local banker. The Boy Scouts enjoyed the grounds for 15 years until they moved to their current location near Clear Fork Reservoir. Once again, Fleming's Falls was for sale. Lutheran boys had been spending summers on Lake Erie, Camp Lubaca, an Indianized contraction for Lutheran Boys Camp. Girls spent weeks elsewhere. One Lutheran lay leader from First Lutheran Church of Mansfield saw the potential in the Fleming's Falls site for combined Lutheran camping. In 1940, John Linsenmeyer created a homemade movie of the site and showed it in Cincinnati at the 1940 Convention of the Ohio Synod. After a forceful and impassioned plea by Mr. Linsenmeyer, and after much debate, the Lutherans voted to buy the old Fleming's Falls site. In 1941, the Ohio Synod of the United Lutheran Church in America established an outdoor ministry in the old Fleming's Falls site with the goal of teaching the awesome wonder of God's good creation and the saving grace of God in His Son, Jesus Christ. The site was christened Moana, meaning One Who Seeks. The Fleming House was rechristened Oneida Lodge and later put into use as a dining hall. In the inaugural summer of 1941, Lutheran boys came to prepare the site for wider use. Cabins and a dining hall from Camp Lubaca were taken apart, put on flatbed trucks, and reassembled at Camp Moana. The dining hall is used today as a craft cabin. A few of the original cabins are still in use. Legends of the old days at Fleming's Falls still live on in Lower as it is passed down through the generations of campers around the campfire. One tale spins the yarn of a wealthy woman back in the days of those big hats who strained her neck to take in the beauty of the falls. As she did so, her valuable pearl necklace slipped off and fell into the pool below. She hired the best divers money could buy. When they dove in the pool below, they could not find the bottom. Other efforts to plumb the depths were futile and the pool was declared to be bottomless. Believe it or not. Another story which has survived probably from the Boy Scout times tells of a hermit by the name of Hoppy who loved nature and lived in a cave close to the falls. One spring following a harsh winter when Hoppy didn't come into town for his annual supplies, townspeople came to Fleming's Falls only to find his lifeless body wrapped around an abandoned fawn, having given his own life that the deer might live. The Hoppy story hints of another itinerant steward of the earth, Johnny Appleseed, who, in fact, lived in the area in the early 1800s. It also reflects the gospel story of the one who gave his life that we might live. None of the parks served by the southwestern line survives, the last to close being Chippewa Lake in the 1960s. But because Fleming's Falls has not been developed commercially since 1925, it retains much of the same atmosphere and charm as it did a century ago. Today, people come to this site for much the same reason they came in the 1800s. They need a place apart. They need friends who accept them as they are, or as they imagine themselves to be. 
Kamawata provides this today and for generations to come.